I'm a retired pastor in the ELCA, and I have the delight of being in Springfield and being here um, and not being assigned as the pastor, so therefore I don't have to make the decisions about whether there's church or not. So it's great to have everybody here. Two weeks ago I spoke about uh, how the Gospel of Luke that we've been hearing from a lot is about that separation, and I kind of think that this Sunday must be the separation of the north of Interstate 70 versus south of Interstate 70, or something like that. But in every case, it's great for us to be here this morning, and uh, we hope that everybody who isn't here is safe as well. Um, I have a uh, notice here to remind people to turn off your cell phones or turn them off on silent. Um, and if there are any other things that need to be mentioned right now at this time, this is an opportunity to do that. And if not, then we will begin our worship with the order of confession and forgiveness. It can be that we can come to church perhaps burdened by something that uh, did not go well two hours or two days or two months or two years ago or longer. And so that we always, almost always in the Lutheran Church have this time to confess and speak about our sins and our brokenness and then to hear God's promise of forgiveness so that we can continue to worship God with praise and delight. So I ask everyone to stand as able. And we will begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us and forms us, who redeems us and calls us, who unites us and sends us. Gathered in God's presence, let us confess our sin. Mighty and loving God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We seek our own way. We divide the body of Christ. In your mercy, cleanse us and heal us. Let the words of our mouths, the thoughts of our hearts, and everything that we do be filled with faith, hope, and love. Amen. Hear the voice of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim release to the captives. In the name of Jesus Christ, I proclaim to you that your sins are forgiven and you are released. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are yours forever. Amen. I can mention here that perhaps like Jesus, we can say, friend, go up higher if anyone would like to gather in closer. Arise, your light has come, the Spirit's call obey. Show forth the glory of your God, which shines on you today. Arise, your light has come, fling wide the prison door. Your light has come, all you in The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have mercy. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> A reading from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. 
But Moses called to them. And Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. testimonies and the decree that you gave them. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the same shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel for this Transfiguration Sunday according to Luke, the ninth chapter. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, while he was about, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and I'd like to invite any children who'd like to come forward to come forward.
A reading from God's Word. And just as the men were parting from Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. May God add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and to the preaching of God's word. Let us say amen. Amen. Perfect weather, because I have two cold stories this morning. <laughs> and so we can all really get in, the, in the, the feeling of that. So this first story is actually a story from one of my colleagues. Um, and it's about the year that his mother died of ovarian cancer. And so it's about the church youth group. The church youth group's December activity was, you guessed it, Christmas caroling. Now, whether we have ever done that, or whether we've ever been in charge of the youth group Christmas caroling, or even if we've never been along on the renowned youth group Christmas caroling outing, we know more or less how that goes because every one of us has been, well, no, there's like four people who haven't been a teenager, but everybody else, we've all been teenagers at some point. As a youth, you mostly want to talk with your friends. You hope that in the carpools, that you, that in the carpools from house to house, you get to sit next to that person that you have a crush on. Or if not, you can manage to stand next to them at the next stop. Youth group caroling, it's great opportunity for flirt, great opportunity for flirting, especially if maybe someone forgot their mittens and you can keep their hands warm. <clears throat> Nobody ever did that to me, but you know, <laughs> the idea is there, right? You wonder when you're out there caroling, do your friends think it's corny that we're even doing this? And you're always glad when it comes to, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, because then you know that you're done with the stop at that house, you're going to get back in a warm car and go on to the next house. And you wonder, how many more houses do you have to go to? And will there be enough marshmallows for the hot chocolate? Because that's really the point of hot chocolate, right? Is to have marshmallows. <clears throat> and you remember that you've been to this particular house last year as well. But when you're in the youth group, you don't know why you have been to this particular house last year, because you don't know that Mrs. Sharon has ovarian cancer. My colleague recounted just the scene that I have described and pointed out that those 50 teenagers did not know that they were part of a once-in-a-lifetime experience for his mother because she died the following spring. This was her last experience of hearing Christmas carolers in her life. And like many youth and many of us, their minds were on many things, and no one there really knew how unique this experience was. And if they had known, oh, how fiercely they would have tried to hold on, to preserve, how strongly they would have sung, how carefully they would have said, good night and God bless you, how much they would have cherished that moment. So now, another cold story. This is a story about pond skating. <clears throat> I'm from a big family, I have four younger brothers, and either our parents couldn't afford to buy ice skates, or it's possible that my mom was too busy and never got around to it. I mean, she did have my four younger brothers. There were five of us in eight years. But in any case, I never got ice skates until I was in fourth grade. I was nine years old. And even then, I got hand-me-down skates from our neighbors. And you know what I got? I got boys' black hockey skates. And back in the day, in the mid-60s, for a girl, that was pretty awful. But still, I wanted to skate, so I took those boys' hockey skates three blocks away to Garwood Park in New Jersey, where they would flood the parking lot and we would skate. 
Now, mostly that worked reasonably well, but sometimes we would go to the park three blocks away and we would find out that the bullies had wrecked the ice. The bullies, we don't know who the bullies were, but that was the word, the bullies had wrecked the ice because they had stomped on it and the pieces had frozen this way and that way and you couldn't skate on it because it was just all these broken up and refrozen pieces of ice. So that was the sad part. But eventually, I did learn to skate. And later, when it wasn't all toddlers all over the house, my mom would drive us to Tamaquas Park to a real pond. There was much more room, and no bullies had destroyed the ice because the pond was too deep. So later on, when I was in high school, my family moved, and I had the chance to skate on a pond on the edge of the forest of a national wildlife refuge. It still was in the middle of the New Jersey suburbs, but they uh, didn't build another airport, and we all might have suffered from that at one point or another, but they didn't build another airport. Instead, they made it into a national wildlife refuge, and it was right behind our house. So we'd put our skates on in the kitchen, go down to the ice pond, which was really just a marshy area with grassy hummocks and small maple trees all over. There's lots of wetlands around here, just, and that's the kind of place it was. It wasn't really deep, and it didn't really matter if we broke through the thin ice, because you know probably wouldn't have gone no more than up to here, and we were right near our house and the kitchen door in any case. So then that's where I skated somewhat often and have continued to skate. So then I moved to Springfield, Missouri, uh, this is my second winter here, and clearly, considering the weather we have having, I have moved to a great place for pond skating. Well, people have told me, not so much. There's lots of cold weather, not too much snow to ruin the ice, that's great. But actually, I'm told the ponds don't freeze that much, so Pastor Ruth, don't go pond skating here in Springfield. And you know, the other problem is I can't find my ice skates in the still-packed moving boxes. So I may need to make a run to play it against sports or something, but you know, buying another pair of skates is just not the same as those really cool skates with the rabbit fur dyed light blue and the little jingly bells, which is what I used to skate on back in the day. And actually, the truth is that I'm not that great a skater. The pond was full of grassy hummocks. And so that, you know, you'd have a place to, to skate, but you know, you try to skate backwards, crash, you know, you run into a grassy hummock. They don't hurt, but it's kind of hard to learn how to skate backwards because there's stuff behind you all the time. But there was this magic thing about that ice, that pond. This was the cool thing that sometimes my brothers and I would see muskrat trails, or turtles, or otters, or little fish under the ice, because it was thin, and it was clear, and we could see this. Now, many of us have had cool events in our childhood, and any of us who have been parents probably have wanted to share some of those things with our kids. And if we are children, young children or grown children, our parents have probably wanted to do the same thing with us. So I have a son, I'm going to try next time I'm here not to talk about him in my sermon, but he's here again. I have a son who's now a young adult, and with whom, and with my son, of course, I wanted to share the fun of pond skating. So my son and I found a pretty cool pond that was one town over. Very few people skated there, but we had friends who also liked pond skating. We never went there alone. But we would watch the weather, and we would call them up and say, is it time? Do you think the ice is thick enough? Shall we go together? So of course, with pond skating, if you um, hit the weather just right, the ice is thick enough to hold you, but it's still clear, and that's the magic again. But here's what happened. For my son, not so much. He was always a bit nervous about pond skating. I tried to get him to trust my ice expertise and my years of experience, mainly my experience on how long it stayed cold and how clear the ice was or not, and how much cracking noise it made when you skated on it. But mostly, he wasn't really having it. <clears throat> so, no picture. Okay, so <clears throat> one day, when the conditions were good enough, we went out skating on the pond and over to the shallow end of the pond. 
We were just pretending to make figure eights, and we were looking at whatever we could see underneath the clear, shallow ice. And you could actually see right through. You could see branches of trees. You could see the leaves on the bottom below the clear, frozen ice. And there, magically, we really saw a turtle. A turtle, yeah. And the turtle was about this big, and it was just moving around slowly. But it was really a turtle, because you could see its legs. It was really under there, under the ice, moving around. And it was really a turtle. Now, Luke and I worked hard. <laughs> we both did, to be sure there would be a picture of this. But it is pretty hard to take a picture of a turtle under the ice. And it's probably as hard as building a booth or a dwelling on top of a mountain. So that's uh, part of what comes along later on in here. Um, it's not a very good picture, and it's not even here. So that's just fine, because it proves the point I'll make later on. So this turtle, I tried to take a picture. It was just swimming around under the water, not too fast. And eventually, we lost sight of it, because it went under the ice where you couldn't see anymore. But how cool is that? to see a turtle under the ice. So I told this story to a friend who's older than I am who grew up in rural Ohio, and she said to me, all my life I've been skating on ponds and I've never seen a turtle or anything under the ice. So all our lives, we have done what God has called us to do. Our work, our families, our travels, our hobbies, our charities, our cooking and driving and vacations and church work and gardening and shoveling and sleep. All our lives we have done these things. Our lives are filled with chores and responsibilities, but I would also hope that we get a good amount of joy and delight from what we do. And certainly, if you have ever gone pond skating or skating anywhere, you do it for fun. That's the point. There is grace and freedom once you learn how, and there's lightness, and maybe there's even someone special that you get to skate with and enjoy. And maybe, once in a while, you might even see a muskrat or a turtle under the ice. So here's this story of Peter, James, and John, not exactly doing their chores, but doing what they enjoyed doing, living their lives and following Jesus. They had been following him for a long time, and I'm sure they enjoyed it. They were popular. People wanted to hang around with them, and they got to share amazing experiences together, hearing the wisdom and wonderful stories of Jesus, seeing his love for and his healing of people, seeing how he lived a grace-filled life, like the grace-filled image of skating that perhaps you have in your mind, but ever so much more so. And Peter, James, and John were used to the patterns and activities of life following Jesus. And then he invited them up on a mountain with him. And then, along with him, they saw the ancient revered prophets they had heard of all their lives, Moses and Elijah, right there. <coughs> they had never experienced anything like this, never even dreamed that it would happen, but oh, how they had longed for something as wonderful, as special, as beautiful, as powerful as this experience with Jesus. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So when in our lives we speak of a mountaintop experience, or when I spoke with the children earlier about some super special time in their lives, this is what we are speaking about. Once in a while, we have that wonderful sense of the power and beauty and love of God. Perhaps coming out of surgery. Maybe at the wedding of someone we love. Possibly, we hope, at the birth of a child or on a grand vacation seeing a glorious sunset or sunrise, sometime when everything about Christmas or Easter is just right. 
perhaps when we are gathered with friends or family at a reunion, or maybe when we see a turtle under the ice. And this, for me, here is the power and message of this transfiguration story. Because here is Peter, who has longed for this vision of God, who has now seen the prophets face to face, and he wants it to last forever. As in that song that we perhaps have sung in church over the years, we long to hold the vision bright and make this hill our home. He says, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because then, Jesus, you will always be here. We can preserve this special, most special, once-in-a-lifetime moment forever. And isn't that just what we want to do? When we have such an experience in our lives, please let us preserve this moment. Let this life be like this forever. Mm. When I was growing up on this Sunday, we always sang a hymn that ended like this. How good, Lord, to be here, yet we may not remain. Let me start again. How good, Lord, to be here, yet we may not remain. But since you bid us leave the mount, come with us to the plain. This song contains the three points that I hope we will carry away with us this Transfiguration Sunday. First of all, and you know, this is what our mom and our dad and our grandparents and everybody else who's older always said to us, if all of life were mountaintop moments, what would it be like? Like eating ice cream and cake all the time or anything so special, if all the time it happened, eventually it changes from special to ordinary. Second, we would love to preserve those special moments, to build a dwelling, to take the most perfect pictures or videos, because trust me, the picture I have of the turtle of the, under the ice, it's, you can tell if you know what you're looking at that it's a turtle under the ice. And that's because, precisely because it's not possible to preserve those moments like they actually happen in the moment. And so we need to cherish those mountaintop experiences, those once-in-a-lifetime experiences. We need to cherish them when they happen. My son and I could not keep the turtle in the same place under the clear ice. Eventually, he or she swam off to do whatever turtles do in February. Whenever we have visions of God, perhaps ahead of us, deeply moving Lenten or Easter or any church experience, whenever we have seen the kingdom of God present and powerful in our lives, we must appreciate it when it is here, since we cannot make that vision last forever. Third and finally, as that hymn says, we cannot remain. Instead, there is so much to appreciate, to do, to work on once we come down from the mountain. There is the regular ordinary beauty of skating, of cherished family and friends, of the fact that we can go shopping and traveling and on vacation, and that we live in a beautiful world even when we have beautiful snow coming down and covering everything with that amazing transformation. If we were to spend all our time longing, aching, wishing we were in those mountaintop experiences, we would miss the regular specialness of ordinary life. Because even if you never see a turtle under the ice, skating is still and always a very special thing to enjoy. And even if we do not see Jesus shining along with Moses and Elijah and maybe our own grandmother and grandfather, we know, we trust, we have the faith that Jesus is with us in every moment of our lives, on the mountaintop and most certainly in each and every day that we spend here on the plain. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. United as one body in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. We pray for the church. Open us to listen to your word and to do your will. Direct us in paths of faithful service that reflect your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the earth, your beloved creation and our fragile home, for mountains and prairies, for cities and wilderness areas, renew places we have neglected or misused, where natural disasters have altered the land, Help us honor nature's healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the nations, shine the light of truth into world relationships hindered by mistrust or misunderstanding. Bring freedom and stability to all nations. Shelter those who have been displaced by war, famine, or natural disaster. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those in need, Free those who struggle with shame or guilt. Bring clarity to those whose judgment is clouded by fear. Comfort those who grieve and heal the sick, especially Joey Herrera, David Dinwiddie, and Valerie Brown. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For this assembly, deepen our faith and understanding. Guide our ministries of hospitality and outreach. Renew us in the baptismal promise to care for others and the world you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayer. prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have died, especially Carolyn Callan. Even in the midst of death, give us faith to trust your promise of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Receive our prayers and fill us with the radiance of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also you. Let us share God's peace with each other.
Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we may be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You called us to live as your people. You promised to be our God. When time and again we failed to trust your promise and refused to walk in your ways, you sent your word made flesh, the root and offspring of David, to dwell among us and draw us back to you. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Send now your Holy Spirit upon these gifts and all who share this meal. By your Spirit, wipe away all tears and mend with mercy what sin has torn, that we might await Christ's coming with glad and joyful hearts and, at last, feast forever at the supper of the Lamb. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father. Yeah. 
forever. Amen. Come to the table. Feast on God's abundant life for you.
Please stand as able for the blessing. The presence and body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. that you have fed us at your banqueting table with bread and wine beyond compare, the very life of Christ for us. Send your spirit with us now that we may set the captive free, use your gifts to build one another up, and in everything reflect your glory revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the announcements. And are there things in particular that need to be mentioned this morning that people know of? Yes. Just a quick reminder that obviously Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday, so we will have services at noon and at seven, I believe. Um, and the soup supper is at 5. There's a little confusion on that, so it will start at 5. And also, Saturday is the assistant worship training that will start at noon. Lunch will be served. We are also doing a separate audiovisual training. If you have any groups that utilize the fellowship hall, try to have someone here so that they can learn, someone can learn that. Um, should take 30 minutes. We're starting at 10.30 on that. I think that's it. Other announcements that need to be made? I think it's also in the bulletin, but um, I will mention that on Thursday uh, evening from 6 to 8, there is a session for uh, people who may be interested in joining as official members, new members um, of Messiah. And um, there will be a supper connected with that. I try to never forget about the food part. So um, that is there. And anything else that needs to be mentioned, it's um, goldenrod today. So pay, I think, goldenrod beige. So pay attention to what's here because that's important. Let us stand then to receive the benediction. Stand as able. The glory of God dwell in you richly name you beloved and shine brightly on your path and the blessing of almighty god the father son and the holy spirit be upon you and remain with you always Amen.
Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, hunger for ministry, nurture your youth, gather the resources for growing ministries, and offer healing and care to all in need. Go in peace. Christ is your light.